When you hear survey results noted as having an error of plus or minus 5%, we're talking about sampling error, sometimes called MOE, or margin of error, and occasionally estimation error. This video begins with a reminder of the difference between a parameter and a statistic, then discusses what sampling error is and isn't, and then we'll focus on how to actually calculate sampling error, including how to adjust for a finite population, and you might want to have a calculator ready if you want to try some of this yourself. I'm sure you all remember that there is a difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter describes a population, the entire population, while a statistic describes a sample of the population. Another way to think of it is that a statistic is used to generalize what the parameter is. We estimate parameters based upon statistics. For example, if you want to know what all the students at a particular university think about the general education requirement, and you conduct a survey of, say, 300 students, you would end up with a statistic, which you would then generalize back to the entire student population. You are estimating a parameter. Anytime you take a sample from a larger group and generalize the results to the larger population, you will end up with sampling error. Sampling error represents the approximate amount of variance you can expect if you ran the same poll with a different sample. It is the error that is caused by observing a sample rather than measuring the whole population. Assume you have a question asking people if they thought violence on television causes violence amongst teens. You ask this of a sample of a population and you get a 50-50 split. If sampling error was, say, less than 4.9%, we would assume that the actual percentage feeling the same way in the overall population would likely vary by less than plus or minus 4.9% of our finding of 50%. In other words, it could be as low as 45.1% saying yes, or as high as 54.9% yes. With this range, we would estimate the percentage of people believing that violence on television causes violence amongst teens as somewhere between 45.1% and 54.9%. We call the range between the low and the high numbers, in this case 45.1 and 54.9%, the confidence interval, which is a range of values so defined that there is a specified probability, in our case 95%, that the value of the parameter lies within it. Don't confuse sampling error with other possible errors, such as measurement error, poor sampling design, coverage error, and non-response error. Sampling error only says, if we were to do this survey again exactly the same but with a different sample drawn from the same population, 19 times out of 20, or 95% of the time, the data we would get would be within plus or minus a certain percent of the data that we got this time. I'm using 95%, but that's not the only confidence level we can use. While not as common, you may find confidence levels of 90% or 99% also being used. To calculate sampling error, you'll need to know the number of respondents answering the question, which we identify with little n. The results of the question, p and q, such as 50 and 50 or 30 and 70, and this refers to the study results. If 50% answered yes to a question, that 50% is subtracted from 100%, leaving 50% who did not answer yes to the question. Alternatively, if 30% answered yes, or p, that means that 70% did not answer yes, or Q. And you'll also need to know the confidence level you are using, for example, 95%, so that you can identify the associated Z-score, again, for example, 1.96. I'm not going to go too far into the Z-score, but it's important to know what confidence levels each Z-score is associated with. The most common Z-scores are for the 50, 80, 90, 95, 98, and 99% confidence levels. But the ones most often used in commercial surveys are the 90%, 95, and 99%. So you'll need to know the Z-scores associated with them, which are, after rounding, 1.65, 1.96, and 2.58. And again, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I want you to recall that we use these Z-scores based upon standard deviations. If the mean is zero, then the z-score of 1.65 accounts for the scores within one standard deviation from the mean, or 68% of the scores. The z-score of 1.96 encompasses all of the scores within two standard deviations from the mean, or 95% of the scores, and so on. Now let's learn how to calculate sampling error. The basic formula is the square root of p times q divided by n multiplied by the z-score. Remember that P is the proportion, 
or the percentage who gave a particular answer, such as 30% said yes to a question, or when displayed as a proportion, 0 0.30. Then Q is 1 minus P, or 100 minus P if P happens to be a percentage. So this could be 1 minus 0.3 or 0.7, meaning that 70% did not answer yes to the question. Now note that this doesn't say that 70% said no, because it could easily be a combination of no and undecided answers. It just means that 70% did not answer yes. Little n is the sample size, and z is the z-score for the confidence level you want. Let's plug some data into that formula. Assume that 400 people answered the question, where 50% said yes. Well, that means that the remaining 50% did not say yes. We'll use a confidence level of 95%, meaning the z-score we will use is 1.96. So if you plug it into the formula, and you can stop this video and calculate it yourself, you'll end up with plus or minus 4.96. You may have noticed that we use the 50-50 split a lot for the P and Q. That's not just because its product, 2500, is easy to remember and plug into the formula, but because oftentimes we want to estimate the worst case scenario, which is a 50-50 chance. We will use this sampling error, the worst case scenario, when we project what the survey results may be, as when we are designing the project before we do all the research. And we will also use this sampling error to encompass the entire study, which is composed of many questions that would have varying results. In other words, we are saying that the sampling error couldn't be worse than the 50-50 threshold. The other issue I want to draw to your attention is that for all of our examples, I have used yes and no as the survey responses and telling you both P and Q. But you really only need to know the one response you are interested in, and that will be P, because you can then calculate Q. For example, assuming that you are asking a rating question where respondents answer with excellent, good, fair, or poor, and you want to know what sampling error is for the excellent responses, you have P at 45% meaning you can figure out by subtracting that from 100 that Q is 65%. Again, you are comparing the 45% who rated something excellent against the 65% who did not choose the excellent response. Here's some more practice for you. For this first one, assume that we have 300 answering the question and 50% said yes, that would be P. So of course you can calculate that Q would be 50%. You're using the confidence level of 99%, so you look up the z-score, and you've got 2.58. You can stop and calculate it yourself, and then you'll find that it's plus or minus 7.4%. Here's another one. Now we have 400 answering the survey, where the question results are 10% who said yes, or P. So of course you can calculate Q at 90%, and the confidence level we're assuming here is at 90%. You look up the z-score, and it's 1.65 plug it all into the formula, and you get plus or minus 2.5%. Okay, last one. Now we have 100 answering the question with 60% who said yes, or P. So Q is 40%, and the confidence level we want to use for this one is 95%. You look up the z-score, you find 1.96, plug it all into the equation, and you'll get plus or minus 9.6%. Now say you're conducting a customer satisfaction survey for a small business with, say, 200 customers. If you complete interviews with 100 of those customers, your results should be more accurate than the confidence intervals we've previously discussed, right? There should be less error. That's what we would call a finite population. And in this case, the word population refers to the real population, 200 customers in our example, not the survey population. Remember that we use little n to represent the number of respondents answering a question, in our case, 100. We use big N to represent the population. Again, in our example, the entire customer base of 200. You would consider using a finite population correction when the sampling fraction is greater than 5%, which in our example definitely applies, because 100 is 50% of 200, much greater than 5%. Now the tipping point is about 150,000, but you don't get very much of a correction when your population starts to get above 3,000. So my rule of thumb is if the overall population is 3,000 or fewer, I would consider calculating a finite population correction. The formula is fairly simple, 1 minus the square root of little n over big N. 
Remember that little n is the number of respondents in the study population, and big N is the number of respondents in the overall or real population. Now I've also seen the formula written this way. You calculate sampling error for a finite population by first calculating the sampling error as usual. Remember the formula of the square root of p times q divided by n multiplied by the z-score. Then you calculate the finite population correction, 1 minus the square root of n over n, small n over big N. And then you multiply the two products together. Let's plug those numbers into the formula, and if you'd like, you can stop the video now and try to calculate it yourself. So first, we calculate standard sampling error. We have 50% who said yes, so that would be P, leaving 50% who did not say yes, or Q. Divide that product by the number answering the question, or 100. Take the square root of that, then multiply the whole thing by the z-score associated with the 95% confidence interval, or 1.96 you end up with a sampling error of plus or minus 9.8%. Then you calculate the finite correction factor. Little n, or the number answering the question, 100, divided by the big N, the number in the population, or 200. Take the square root of that, then subtract that from 1. You should end up with a finite correction factor of 0.293. And then the last step is to multiply the two, ending up with a sampling error of plus or minus 2.9 percent. Processing time. Why is sampling error important? What do you need to calculate sampling error? Now obviously you need the formula, but more specifically you need the number of respondents answering the question, the results of the question, P and Q, and the z-score associated with the confidence level you're using. And what do you do if you're dealing with a small population, such as conducting a survey for a small business with only 500 customers? You would apply a finite population correction. You should now be able to understand not only what sampling error is, but how to calculate it.